so the the control today is really talking about uh, metrology and metrology in general enables process control and reduces cost and there's a pretty famous quote out there and uh, some people uh, attribute it to Peter Drucker who's kind of the father of manufacturing control people say and other people attribute it to others but you know it's uh, that if you can't measure it you can't improve it and that's actually not always true oftentimes you know when things need improvement even if you can't quantify them but it is particularly true when it comes to small scale surface features there's just no way for human beings or simplistic devices to really be able to quantify things to the level that are needed in modern manufacturing and therefore one is unable to really properly even dispose of parts as good or bad and the cost of uh, lack of control is pretty severe so quality digest did a survey of uh, 100 different companies that are subscribers and found that uh, the company's own estimates said that lack of proper quality control was costing them more than $2 million a year per company on average. And the National Institute of Standards in the U.S. has performed many studies on uh, quality control and metrology and in general has shown that almost a 50 to 1 uh, payoff when investing in metrology. But surface measurement or metrology, that can mean a lot of different things. Uh, it can be roughness or very fine scale surface features. It can talk about waviness um, on a part or overall part shape. It can also include though microgeometries, so small radii, uh, chamfers, uh, blend radius, things like that, small steps. And it can also include uh, defect metrology, so scratches, burrs, nicks, dents, corrosion, etc. And really the focus of the talk today is going to be on those small scale surface geometries because they kind of fall in a void. Uh, a lot of times people are still using visual techniques to try and estimate these or simple hard gauges and uh, there's a lot of tools out there, CMMs for shape and scratch testers for roughness but there hasn't really been anything that's shop capable and for rapid uh, microgeometry and defect characterization. So why do those types of uh, small scale features matter? Uh, well, oftentimes they can be a safety concern. So burrs and sharp edges are actually a major source of injury in manufacturing environments and uh, they can be dangerous. Uh, other safety issues associated with uh, small scale defects can be electrical shorts or cut wires or damaged parts uh, due to burrs and sharp edges on machine components. Uh, it can also affect performance. So be it pitting or nicks or burrs or edge break, uh, they all can have different effects on efficiency or leakage or damaging of other parts uh, through friction or even things like fluid flow. So edge break uh, radius is actually a critical parameter in both the aerospace and automotive industries for ensuring proper fuel flow, proper airflow, hydraulics, etc. It can also really affect longevity of parts. So defects can lead to excessive wear, uh, they can start corrosion, uh, structural integrity can be compromised by voids or nicks, and chamfers and edge radii are designed to prevent cracking on parts under stress. And then lastly, there's the ever important customer perception. So the human eye is excellent at seeing small flaws. And that's actually one of the problems with trying to use the eye to characterize them is the eye will oftentimes be more critical than actual metrology in terms of disposing of parts as being bad. Uh, and the reality is customers and, and manufacturers will reject parts that they suspect. No one wants to let a bad part go through. And what that means is that there's an excessive amount of rework and rejection regarding small scale features when they're not properly measured. And the consequences of poor quality can be really severe for organizations. So there's internal failure, failure costs, which include things like 
uh, cost of injuries, waste, scrap, uh, shortages of parts due to uh, lack of yield, reinspection time, and uh, additional failure analysis and meetings. And then also external or outward facing costs. And those include things like repair and service costs, warranties, handling customer complaints, uh, customer downtime or internal downtime, throughput hits, and most importantly, in many ways, customer perception of the quality of your organization and, uh, and what you're producing. And when you're thinking about measurement, you know, a lot of people go right to the instrument itself, but really you have to think about three different things and how they interact. It's how the environment of the measurement uh, interacts with the instrument and with the operator. So ideally you want an instrument that can go anywhere and be used by anybody and give you accurate results. Uh, but there's always a trade-off, right? How portable is it versus how accurate is it? How easy to use is it versus how flexible it is in different situations? And those all have to be balanced and weighed when determining what is the best measurement system that's going to help you control your process, that's going to help improve quality. But traditional shop floor inspection methods really are insufficient for today's world. So a lot of people use still visual and fingernail tests for assessing uh, things like step heights, uh, pit depths, uh, even radii and, and other critical geometries. Uh, but the reality is most people know those are highly operator dependent, they're non-gauge capable. So often when it fails, you know it really failed. But if anything's close to the edge, a lot of times people will reject or rework because there's just uncertain. The next level of sophistication involves replication, often using a rubber type material, and then looking at that on either a surface profiler or a shadow graph. Um, here you wind up with high material costs. The replication materials are not cheap. Uh, it takes time to apply the material, allow it to dry, do the measurement, and you still wind up with a lot of operator um, variability and even material dependence if the replication material didn't really get all the way into a scratch or a defect it's not going to give you accurate results so just to give you an example of why kind of a, these 2d or shadow graph measurements can be problematic we can take what's fundamentally a 3d measurement so this is a, a false color height map of a pit where blue is low and red is high you can actually see the displaced material as well in the red ridge. And if you just draw a couple different traces and you can think of that as a couple different shadows on your shadow graph or uh, stylus traces, you can see that your result differs by almost a third. So if you had a limit that was three thou, in one case it might fail, in the other case it might pass. And if you use actual 3D data, uh, you can actually identify the entire pit and get a very accurate measurement of the surface, uh, of the depth of that, as well as things like area, volume, length, width, all sorts of information that lets you not just uh, dispose of a part now, but if you store all of that information and use it for future fingerprinting, you can actually sometimes loosen specifications by really correlating part failure to defects, and you can even load this information into modeling software and do life testing and things like that. There's lab-based three-dimensional and two-dimensional metrology systems as well, but it's often impractical for process control and hard to do things like defect characterization. Uh, the systems are typically quite expensive. They're limited to small parts because they're fundamentally you know, types of microscopes or even the stylus has a limited vertical and lateral range. Um, they often require sophisticated operators that know how to manipulate the data to get results. And uh, a lot of times the throughput is slow. These are in labs, the labs get full, you don't get feedback immediately on the production line. And so what we wound up developing in conjunction with various folks, uh, primarily in the uh, aerospace industry, but also 
other precision manufacturers is a portable, mostly handheld, uh, three-dimensional surface gauge that can go on the shop floor. So the goal is be able to measure and provide all of the analysis within just a couple of seconds. Have a good field of view so you can see both radii, burrs, nicks, dents, all the critical small features, uh, edge break and chamfers that people want. Uh, be able to output a full XYZ point cloud, but also have built-in software that will automatically find defects. And when you have a vibration immune metrology system, as you see on the left, it can be handheld, or in the center, it can actually be automated and put on a robot or even next to a machining center. Um, or you can even use it, as you see on the right, as if it were a microscope system for certain applications. And this just kind of gives you an example um, of some different use cases. So measuring into corners, uh, you can use fold mirrors if it's an optical system to measure underneath things, in between things. Uh, you can do edge measurements with some custom standoffs. And really the goal is to make things very easy a touchscreen interface so that you can do process control in line right on the shop floor where you're producing the parts and not worry about uh, separate rooms that are you know essentially metrology shrines to do uh, critical geometry calculations and when you have that type of flexibility in your measure you wind up with a lot of different applications that are possible so optical techniques are very good at being material independent. So they can measure metals, composites, plastics, rubber, things like that um, in a variety of industries. And also you can do all sorts of different calculations with three dimensional results that you really can't with single two dimensional results. So you can do burr height width volume calculations, look at corrosion depth and aerial coverage, uh, rivet and fastener depth and planarity, edge break and chamfer geometries, radii of curvature, etc. I won't go through them all, but you get a lot of capability when you use a non-contact three-dimensional device. And again, one that's designed to go to the part rather than having the part come into a lab. So I'm just going to go over really briefly some uh, key applications in terms of defects and then I'm going to turn it over to Kramer who's actually going to do some measurements and show you guys uh, what's going on. So you know, one application I mentioned before is corrosion pitting but with a three-dimensional device uh, in this case we're actually looking at 108 different pits at once. They're sorted by height. You can do again volume, feature, aerial coverage, uh, calculations all automatically. You can uh, look at scratches. They can be characterized automatically. No guessing on where the deepest part of the scratch is. And also, once you measure the deepest part of the scratch, if you need to machine that away, you know exactly how much material to remove and no more to get rid of the scratch. And a lot of times that's critical because you're allowed so much minimum part thickness. And if you go beyond that, you can't repair it. So knowing the depth accurately actually allows you to save parts that otherwise you might over machine and wind up uh, scrapping. Uh, looking at burrs and Kramer will show some examples of this, but if we have a machine part and, and you haven't broken the edge, you can get burrs along the side edge as you see in the upper right in the three dimensional view of the part. And in the upper left, you kind of have a, a bright field image of it. And again, with three-dimensional results down below, we can ask the software automatically find, in this case, all peaks uh, bigger than a thousandth of an inch or 25 microns. And uh, it automatically flags the areas, gives you heights, widths, uh, volumes, and depths. And even other machining errors. So a lot of times in stamping processes or sometimes when you're machining you have multiple processes going uh going on with parts and you can wind up with tearing or other issues with the part where the you know second pass of the machine wasn't quite right or the part actually broke off you know before the machining uh the cutting tool 
was all the way through. And you can even characterize that. So in this case, we have something sticking up about 26 thousandths of an inch. So you know how much needs to be machined away. You can actually characterize that. An edge break yeah, looks like and we have a, chamfer jam. Go ahead. So we have a, we have a question real quick. Uh, what are the advantages of robotic deburring? So if I could jump in there real quick. Oh yeah, so you know if you actually do do measurements and uh, our system you know fully supports uh, both the UR3 robots natively and otherwise, so you can actually automate your measurement um, and then come back with automated deburring as well. And the main advantage is going to be speed. So you're not going to overwork the edge. You're not going to take away more material than you need to. And that's going to save a lot of time. So if you actually come through and know that the tallest feature is 10 thousandths of an inch tall, you can actually program that in or even load that information automatically into uh, the deburring process, tell it exactly how much material to remove, and you know get on with your day. So it prevents over-machining of parts and winds up saving both tooling costs and time in terms of production. And I think this is near my last slide, and then again, we'll actually show you some results and let you guys, will probably have more questions about um, the system and, and how it can be used in practice as we go through. But uh, edge break and chamfer radii are pretty critical for, for new part manufacturing. Um, it's really important to break an edge, again, to prevent people from cutting themselves, but also for part performance. And there's even critical, you know, kind of industry standard targets that need to be met. So you need at least a, a 75 micron radius or uh, three thousandths in order to avoid injury from contact. That's kind of the minimum radius um, to make something not dangerous to skin, if you will. But then if you're thinking about something that might be in contact with wires or with other material, you need a much broader radius. A lot of cases about a one millimeter radius or, or 20 thousandths, and that will prevent an edge from actually cutting into wires or electrical circuits or things like that. And then there's a lot of other requirements for appearance, performance, et cetera, that are placed on anything from cell phone cases to you know automotive transmissions and uh, bearings and races. But the advantage of three-dimensional results is they allow characterization all along the test piece and all of your results are independent of part orientation and Kramer will show you that in, in greater detail. So uh, additive manufacturing, again, you can characterize layer heights, process variations, and the upshot of all of this is you're gonna reduce your rework rate, you're gonna reduce measurement time, and ultimately increase yield. A lot of times people think metrology reduces yield because it's gonna highlight problems. The reality is actually the opposite. If you can do fast metrology that's accurate, you measure right up to the spec line with no hesitation in passing parts that should pass, and you move on with your day. And if there's a problem in production, you can solve it immediately. You don't wait hours or days for results while in the meantime you're potentially making bad parts. So shop floor metrology is really critical for controlling processes. You know, you want rapid results, you want to be able to take the part or the measurement to the part. Um, you know, you're going to maximize field of view and standoff distances as much as possible if you can. Uh, and uh, you know, with optical techniques, you can measure any materials uh, inside corners and other hard to reach places. And you know, vibration immune systems fundamentally of, allow for full automation support. So you can hold it in your hand, you can mount it in a microscope, or you can put it in a machining center uh, with equal fidelity in any of those situations. All right, I'll just get the, uh, the screen from you, Eric, and I'll show my, okay. So I'll show you all my, my setup here. I have the InSpec in uh, the microscope stand here in the desktop desktop uh, configuration 
And this is a configuration some sites like, as Eric uh, showed you guys, uh, some sites like the uh, Ergotron uh, cart that has the uh, on-one computer on it, and you can roll this cart around a uh, the shop to take the inspect to the part. Uh, some sites like ha having on the desktop like I have here, allows you to have it in a microscope stand where I can adjust this height and uh, uh, adjust focus like this. Makes it fairly simple uh, to measure some parts. And uh, I'll go ahead and start by uh, measuring a calibration standard. Uh, everyone likes to see the calibration. Uh, it's a real quick, easy process. So I'll go ahead and start with that. Uh, we have a calibration standard right here. It's a ISO certified standard with uh, multiple uh, heights we are measuring uh, right here. And I'll go ahead and start by uh, placing this standard underneath this uh, blue LED we have here. This blue LED is coming out of the inspect, reflecting off the surface and going back up into the uh, the camera. Anything this blue LED reflects off of, uh, we can create a 3D surface map of that surface. Uh, so I'll get this in focus like that. And when I move this up and down, I can adjust focus. So I'll switch over to my uh, 40 software here. And if I move this up and down, you can see I'm going in and out of focus like so. I'll align this a little bit. There we go. All right. So uh, right now it's a little uh, gray and blurry. I adjust up and down. It gets a little more crisp and green. So when it's green, green means go. Green means I can take a measurement. I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, get our first measurement here. And uh, there's our 3D uh, surface map right here. That's what our uh, measurement looks like. But I can also put this measurement into our calibration screen. And I can go ahead and line this a little better. Uh, line up this, uh, these grooves to the overlay you see. Take a measurement. And that is the calibration process right here. And uh, I'll go ahead and uh, align that a little better, sorry. Like so. All right, and take a measurement. All right, so there's the calibration process. Calibration is verified. Uh, so what the calibration process is doing uh, is telling you your certified calibration height. So what this uh, height standard is certified to, uh, and then it's telling you what we uh, just measured that each of these heights to. So we're measuring these these uh, these depths right here, and so it's telling you our percent error and our maximum percent error for uh, one of these uh, depths we were measuring. Uh, and I'll tell you this calibration is verified. And every time you uh, calibrate this inspect, it will go into the calibration log, so you can have a, a, a running log of every time this uh, inspect was uh, calibrated. And I'll tell you all of these uh, calibration heights and the certified height for your specific standard, so you can keep a keep a history of your calibrations in the past. If you want to look at the uh, 3D measurements. Uh, this is what, what we were looking at earlier. Um, this is the surface map of the uh, this standard right here. This is the live video we're seeing, and this is the uh, the map we took with those measurements. So Kramer, uh, while you're yes sir showing that, uh, maybe you can answer a couple of questions. Uh, one is about surfaces. Uh, can you can we measure highly shiny surfaces? And um, and what is the uh, scan scan rate of the instrument? Yeah, so shiny surfaces aren't a problem for us. I can show you uh, some measurements on shiny surfaces uh, here in a second. Um, unlike lasers, uh, laser systems where uh, alignment matters or uh, that laser reflecting back to us uh, matters, we're using an LED. Uh, I'll show you again uh, right here, and that isn't uh, it's not the coherence that lasers do. That allows us to have this reflect back. So if you get the right angle um, on that LED, you can get that uh, light back on super shiny ultra finished blades uh, to the camera. Um, and we could take that 3D surface map of uh, shiny materials. And uh, the, the scan rate, Edgar, was the other question? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we could take measurements fairly quickly uh, under, under a second. Um, as you could see, I think another one right here. So I just took another measurement right there. It takes, it takes less than a second to take a measurement uh, about 4 million pixels there. 
And in terms of scan rate, there are actually two models of the product too. So the one we're demonstrating here has about an eight millimeter or a third of an inch by a third of an inch field of view. We also have one that has a two thirds inch by two thirds inch or about 16 millimeter field of view. So you can, if you need more coverage more rapidly, uh, you can uh, actually move to that other other system as well with only a slight degradation in uh, the vertical resolution. All right. Okay, so I'll go ahead and take this uh, inspect out of the microscope stand, take some handheld measurements. Uh, that is uh, kind of our claim to fame with this. Uh, it's a vibration immune handheld surface gauge. Um, it takes ins instantaneous 3D measurements, so we can uh, we're able to put this uh, as a handheld instrument and mount this on a robot. Um, I'll go ahead and start with a uh, a quick uh, measurement on this uh, this shiny. Uh, uh, material here um, has some part markings on it and I can go ahead and just take a quick measurement on that just to show you how I would take a measurement on something shiny like this um, it's fairly simple fairly straightforward and uh, I just use this uh, I put this uh, focus aid in there in the front just to help me get to the right uh, focal distance so I can just put the inspect down at the right distance click this button here and take a measurement. I can put this down anywhere else, click that button, I'll be able to take a measurement. So I can put this onto this inspect and I'll uh, just align it so that the light reflects off of it and uh, goes up uh, back to the camera and then you can you can search around for it. It's uh, pretty independent of uh, tilt so I can just find the right spot so the brightness um, is adequate. I'll take a measurement on something shiny like this. Um, I'll go back to our software you can see I can just adjust, uh, adjust the tilt of the inspec, and I'll go ahead and uh, all right, and I'll get that in focus. Take a measurement by clicking that button. I can get a 3D surface map of uh, of, of this uh, of these part markings there. So something that Eric touched on about uh, the inspec is this uh, feature analysis page. Um, so these part markings um, can uh, all be simultaneously and individually analyzed uh, together with this 3D data. So each one of these uh, depths, each one of these pits are being uh, analyzed by its weighted height percentage. So what that means is uh, it's taking the 5%, which we're saying right here, 5% deepest pixels and averaging those out. Uh, so that's what's displaying, displaying here. We're displaying the area volume, uh, feature length, feature width. Everything you want to know about any one of these features is being displayed at the same time. So you can uh, click any one of these and everything deeper than a uh, thousandth of an inch, you can adjust this as well uh, is being shown for you. All right. So that's something, uh, that's the shiniest object to have currently in this room. Um, I go ahead and uh, take a quick measurement on some uh, some burrs. I'll go ahead and set this back up in the microscope stand real quick. I'll show you guys what I'm doing. I'll set this back up in here. I'll take a we have a machine part here that has some burrs on it. It's pretty rough on the edge there. And I'll go and set this up underneath the microscope stand. Uh, get that LED reflecting off of it. Um, go back to my 4D software and uh, get the auto brightness there and uh, get that brightness to the right level and I'll adjust this height so that I am green and in focus like so all right look good okay so I will go ahead and take a measurement here Okay, do 3D. Let's take a measurement along this edge just to look at some uh, some birds that may be present here. Make sure we get a, a nice and nice nice image here. You see on the edge there are some birds. Um, go into a feature analysis and look for heights. We were looking for depths earlier. 
you look at heights, you can see the uh, they're sticking up right here. And we can each one of these birds are being analyzed. This one's a, a fairly extreme example on this machining, um, but each one of these are being flagged as a higher than a thousandth of an inch and being displayed here. Um, allows you to, to see how, how how high these birds are being uh, displaced over the, the edge of that this uh, machine part. So There's a quick measurement that allows you to see uh, these heights. Go ahead and try to see the uh, other side, just to, just to compare. This other side's a little cleaner. All right. All right, I'll take a measurement of that. All right, so this other side's a little cleaner. Um, you can see that there are no burrs over a thousand, a thousandth of an inch. Uh, being flagged here, so that means this uh, this part uh, on this side is is uh, free of any burrs that are higher than a thousandth of an inch. Whereas here uh, we have these these large burrs right here sticking up. That's a little that's a little bit of how uh, this feature analysis works. You can uh, take take a part and. Uh, See if it if uh, your part is passing. So in this case, if our, our specification was a thousandth of an inch, uh, then this part is clean right here. And where this this part, we're seeing some features here. We know this is out of spec. And also, although we've been looking at you know either high or low material, if you have gouges or spalling or things like that, we can analyze both simultaneously so that you can get uh, both the low and high points within a given surface calculated at once. Yeah, and just for, just for example, I can uh, show you some pits that are higher than uh, uh, a half a thousandth of an inch here. I guess deeper. Uh, also, sort of tied to what you're showing here, uh, there is a question on lateral resolution. So basically, how small a feature would we be looking at? Yeah, so yeah, the can... lateral resolution of the system is uh, yeah around uh, three tenths of a thou, or around seven microns, for uh, for the system. So mostly, we would say then that you could look uh, laterally at things that are, you know, usually you know mathematically you would say twice that. But realistically, uh, you know, I would say anything smaller than a thou could be looked at um, laterally or smaller than about uh, uh, 15 microns or so. And then okay. vertically, um, the standard product here has, a, again, a resolution of a tenth of a thou or uh, around two and a half microns. And then the large field of view system has a vertical resolution around three tenths of a thou or around uh, seven micrometers. All right, I can go ahead and uh, show you all another measurements um, on a curved blade this time. Uh, we have a little, this is some defect analysis. So we have a little defect, a little nick and a scratch um, on this blade, this curved blade. Uh, so to take a measurement on something like this, I would just uh, put it back in this uh, focus aid right here and put the uh, uh, inspect up to the defect I'm uh, curious in. I want to inspect and I would just click this button when I'm ready to click it and take a, take a service map of this defect. And I can uh, go back to my 40 software here. Make my live video and take a look at this defect. Get that in focus like so. All right, take a measurement of that. So right now I will be just removing uh, a tilt. So I'm removing the tilt of the end spec. Oh, I'm moving variable here. So I can show you. Uh, uh, 
I'll set, uh, I'll set a uh, specification of a thousandth of an inch. So anything deeper than that uh, in this uh, on this defect will be flagged as a feature. So here, we, here, we, here is our main uh, feature right here. Uh, we've seen about uh, 38 thousandths, or sorry, three thousandths uh, of an inch right here. Uh, so I just took a measurement of that and it's displaying this for me. If I want to save this um, this window out to uh, have a record of what this measurement was, I can click the screenshot button, uh, save that wherever I want to save it, uh, any directory I want to save it in. I can save this uh, table as a CSV file if I want to ex export to Excel or anything like that. I can save it wherever I want to save that. And I can save this measurement um, as a whole. Uh, I can save this whole 3D measurement as a 4D file um, that allows me to uh, put it back into our software, or I can save it as a the OPD or XYZ point cloud or CSV file to put into uh, third-party software. Okay. So we have a couple additional questions that I'll I'll answer real quick. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I was falling behind here. Um, so uh, one, someone's asking about the technology behind the system, it is a type of uh, structured light or fringe projection, but it's specialized, it's called polarized structured light. And uh, we can send you a, an article on that. Uh, we've been written up in a variety of you know, technical journals that will describe that more, but it is a type of fringe projection. Um, also, they were asking about automation. Um, it can be mounted on a robot or XY table or mounted above a, a conveyor belt or things. And we do work with other uh, robots other than UR. Uh, UR robots are what we have native within our software, but we actually have a remote access package. So you can send uh, commands to the system as if it were a probe. So you can tell it, load a recipe, take a measurement, send me the defect data or send me the 3D data. All of that's possible. Um, uh, in terms of sending, you know, signals back and forth, again, we can send the results of the measurement and then, um, you know, we'd have to write some handoff to to tell something, you know, how to remove a burr. Uh, cost, um, you know, I'm going to uh, defer that mostly. I'm, I'm the technical guy. Roughly, uh, you know, depending on options and everything, um, systems start around uh, or are, you know cost around uh, fifty thousand dollars US up to you know eighty thousand dollars US um, do, you know depending on what what options and things are available with the system. And then the last question, and then I'll let you get on with things. Someone's asking about transparent uh, plastic material. We can measure uh, things that are uh, like deep scratches and gouges on that, but we can't measure roughness on that. And depending on what the features are, we'd have to see. So uh, we can measure opaque plastics, no problem. Sometimes transparent things are just simply, uh, you know, you know, the light penetrates and we don't get a signal back. So we'd have to uh, get some samples in, but you see how quick measurements are. So we're happy to to get samples in house, and certainly we we measure you know solar panel glass and other uh, transparent surfaces, no problem. So it really depends on the geometry. All right. So this is a uh, right here is what the inspect is being used for uh, around the world currently. Defect analysis is quick, it's easy, um, gives you quantitative uh, uh, readout real fast. Uh, just for any inspectors that were trying to guess how deep this um, uh, pit was. But our new application this year would be uh, edge break analysis and uh, for uh, small geometries like chamfers and rounded edges. So for testing on that, we had uh, made this uh, edge break uh, standard. I can give you a little close up of that on this uh, PowerPoint real fast, what this actually looks like. Um, this side has a, a chamfer on it. It's a machine flat um, just to break this uh, sharp edge and uh, this other side has a rounded edge on it uh, this corner has been rounded off so that it's no longer sharp 
And uh, we can uh, take some measurements on this. You can see here I'm perpendicular um, to this chamfer face, so I can get uh, this LED reflecting off all three of these planes um, and get data off uh, all three of the planes. So go ahead and take some measurements real quick, uh, show what that looks like on this uh, standard here. And so basically to take these measurements, I will just uh, uh, use an inspect like this. And then once again, once I'm in focus, I will click this button, take my measurement, get my 3D surface map of that small geometry. And uh, my, th uh, my software analysis can uh, give me the parameters on that, uh, that chamfer. So I get this into focus, like so. Take the measurements. You can see here I'm a little uh, misaligned, and that's okay. I'll go ahead and uh, the correct shape removal on that. And this this is a 3D uh, measurement, so it doesn't matter what uh, uh, alignment I have. I can be a skew up to 45 degrees uh, with this clocking. We've done a lot of testing on that. What's happening here with the chamfer analysis is uh, it's going to identify all the data points that belong to this plane, all the data points that belong to this chamfer face, and all the data points that belong to this uh, right plane. So you can see that happening here. All these red data points belong to this uh, chamfer face, blue ones belong to this left side, and the right one, uh, the pink ones belong to this uh, right plane. So uh, this, uh, these left lengths and these right length. Uh, are certified to 40 thousandths of an inch. You can see that's what uh, we're getting just about right here. And it's also reconstructing the material that's been removed. And I can show you what all these parameters mean, probably easier with a uh, diagram like this. So it's, uh, the mathematics are reconstructing uh, the material that's been removed by extending this plane and this plane to where they would intersect. It's telling you this right length of material that's been uh, uh, removed during the machining process and this uh, left length as well. And it's telling you all these little angles in between. And uh, of course, it's telling you this uh, chamfer length, that physical length that uh, can be measured with uh, stylite or optical uh, comparators. And the difference uh, with how we're doing it um, is that we're using 3D data. So this uh, slight uh, misalignment that I have here, or you can see I was not totally aligned perfectly here. Um, don't matter. We're using 3D data, so we can move that tilt. Um, there's no cosine error that would be seen with those 2D traces. If I did a 2D trace just across here, it would have to be perfectly perpendicular, or else it would measure artificially long. Uh, here we don't have that problem because we can just remove that that uh, that tilt with uh, our mathematics this, in this chamfer analysis here. And each one of these uh, parameters that we're uh, uh, calling out right here can be made it into a pass fill uh, parameter. So I can just put in uh, some quick parameters real quick. And you can see it's being, uh, it's green now. And if I wanted to say make it fail, show you what that looks like. And now it's red. So we can make these uh, pass fill parameters, uh, uh, each one of these. So it's a, uh, fairly intuitive um, way to uh, measure these chamfers and fairly quick. I can do the same thing to the other side here. Um, the other side is a rounded edge. If you remember the uh, diagram I was looking at, uh, so I can measure rounded edges as well. I can take a measurement just the same way I did a second ago, uh, clicking this button. I'll go ahead and do that back to my live video. Get that in focus. Take measurements. Here I have a uh, nice rounded edge. Um, it's going to identify the uh, points that belong to the left plane, points that belong to the right plane, and then identify where those planes end and the curved area begins, uh, and tell me the radius of curvature in between. So this edge break radius is uh, certified to 40 thousandths. That's about what we're getting there. Um, you can see it identifying the uh, data points that belong to the right side, data points that belong to that left side. And the same idea here, you can see I didn't do a great job <clears throat> just uh, by hand, uh, getting all, 
data points on this side, but it was enough to uh, uh, get a good measurement. So alignment uh, doesn't matter too much. It takes about sometimes 15 minutes to line up a, a 2D trace, but here I can just put the inspect down, take a measurement fairly simply, and uh, get a good rounded edge results. Uh, Kramer, um, yes, I have a, a request from one of our attendees to, uh, to uh, he's got some sort of utility questions like, uh, uh, you know, sensitivity t tilt, autofocus, and uh, automation uh, for line inspection. Um, and uh, he's he's okayed me to unmute him just so that we can kind of okay. have that conversation, if that's all right. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I'm about to unmute you. Uh, Mark, you can just jump in. Mark, do you, do you hear me? Oh, there you are. Okay. Yes, you do. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation. It looked like an interesting device. Um, yeah, we are, I mean, I, I'm working for a company, maybe you, you know them, DW Fritz. Uh, we are an uh, uh, inspection, inline inspection company. And uh, the reason I registered for your presentation is I'm always looking for new technologies, new sensors that can be used for high accuracy, fast inspection, especially on mechanical parts. So that's the reason of all my questions. Uh, it would be, uh, well, we're not in the business of manual inspection. We are in the business of uh, automatic, uh, fast uh, inline inspection. And uh, measuring edges is always a, an issue. And uh, so what you presented is interesting. Excellent. Uh, I think we actually have a short uh, video clip of the, of the instrument measuring a part in different locations. Yeah, we have a short little clip here of, yeah, of measuring some edge break uh, on an automotive part. Uh, it might give you an idea of what uh, we can do with automation. I'll go ahead and uh, play that real quick here. So this part has dozens of uh, edge break callouts, so it's easier just to automate it for us and uh, to measure it. And uh, so this is just a clip of it uh, going through a routine, measuring uh, uh, with the UR3 robot, and just going through and measuring a couple different uh, edges here. And it's got, uh, so it's programmed to have different uh, settings on each one. And uh, it's just taking me quick measurements on the edges there. So you can, we can program these any way you uh, want them. You can have, um, uh, so an interface, a DLL, which can uh, allows to collect all the data and uh, issue automatic reports uh, on spec, out of spec and things like that. Yeah, you can actually set up a variety of um, different parameters that are going to be reported and they can be reported over the network and saved off as point cloud data or CSV files that can uh, integrate with any kind of process control software or things like that. Um, yeah, Mark, maybe we'll, we should perhaps take this offline. Uh, I, I'm not sure where we're actually working with uh, have been working with Derek uh, Key there. Oh, you know, so you know him. Okay, so yeah, uh, awesome. and uh, uh, we we've wanted to get a get a system up to you guys uh, for evaluation for a while, but uh, you know, 2020 has been a an interesting year as we all know. So, uh, but yeah, it, it's definitely an area uh -huh. where we feel collaboration on automation could be uh, really useful, maybe for both of us. Okay, so I'm I'm useless then because if you if no, you have no. a contact already, I mean it's, it's not cool. not at all. I appreciate the inquiry. I just uh, wanted to let you know that uh, yeah, I, I think uh, you know there are opportunities there. So thanks. No, it's very interesting technology. Thank and, you. Uh, I can see quite a lot of applications for us, but now it's uh, the direct is the right contact. I mean, it's, uh, okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you, Mark. I'll I'll hand it back to Kramer. Okay. To yeah. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the presentation. I'm um, sure I will be off now. And, thank, uh, you. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We may be in contact. Okay. Questions that came in.
as well. So um, someone's asking, is the radius an average value for the whole length? It is, although, uh, you know, there, there's a variety of information that can be pulled out of it. But for right now, we report the average um, edge break or chamfer lengths over uh, the measurement. And uh, another question uh, involving automation is, you know, the, the UI robots we showed are in a lab environment. Uh, you know, do we have customers using systems in production? And we actually do. There's a, a manufacturer of saw blades that is using uh, the robots with our system in production to measure uh, to measure various parameters on those. And so uh, we do have systems, uh, not just in the lab, but in production environments that are fully automated to handling trays of parts and um, you know, moving on. So uh, thank you all very much. And uh, if there are, are any pending uh, questions left that we didn't get to, uh, we, can, we can try to follow up with you after offline. Um, and answer those uh, personally and directly. Thank you so much, all. I'm about to sign off. Take uh, thanks, care. Be safe out there. Yeah, thank you.